Copyright Stanford University. All rights reserved. Absolutely. All right, so this is kind of interesting that I'd be here talking about cred funding in a medical building. I, I kind of took joy in that. You would think that the first people to invite would, might be the, uh, the IT guys. Um, so how many people have heard of Kickstarter, just as, so I get a metric of, like, as so most people at least heard of Kickstarter? Well, a lot of people didn't raise their hands, so the easiest way to get dialed into crowdfunding is to first start with something simple like uh, Kickstarter, which is just a simple form of crowdfunding that allows, so like a social networking site where you get a bunch of people together and throw in small amounts of money and fund something uh, fun. In Kickstarter's case, it's usually creative projects. Maybe people are making a movie, you help them fund the movie. Maybe they're making a band album or starting a bakery or something like that. Basically donation-based. Um, that's you know the thing that most people see first when I get out there. Um, after hopefully after I get done with this talk, and as time goes on, you'll see that in two years from now you won't recognize that you're not you, you won't recognize uh, what crowdfunding used to be based on the potential and what it's going to become soon. Um, but that's the that's the first way to describe Kickstarter or, uh, the, to describe crowdfunding is to start with something like Kickstarter, Indiegogo, Rocket Hub, um, or even Kiva for that matter, and then sort of branch out from there about what it could do. But I've figured out another way that I'm going to try today to describe uh, um, crowdfunding, and that's in terms of uh, why does it match the current economy, and, and then in in some ways that goes hand in hand with why does traditional venture capital not match. Uh, the current kind of economy that we have today. And then you'll see why uh, crowdfunding ha had to happen rather than just describe this as new fad and you know here it is and what can we do with it. It's more like it has to happen, it's happening, and these are the reasons why. So I'm gonna try it that way today. <laughs> um, so this is an interesting way to 
commit crowdfunding with the, uh, with the economic side, and this isn't gonna be an economic talk, but I thought I'd throw this up here. Um, now, I always, you know, I read, a lot of, I read a lot of stuff. I mean, I read economics books and finance and all kinds of stuff, and I always get a, a kick out of reading an economics book and picking it up and reading the definition of, you know, what makes an economy going, and it's basically digging stuff up out of the ground and cutting stuff down and burning fuel and stuff and transforming matter in from one form to the other and selling it. And, um, you know, you really think about that model and, you, and you, you really try to apply it to the companies that we have today. Like, this would be like Facebook or Twitter, <laughs> Dig, Google, you know, Groupon. <laughs> How's, you know, what do they dig up out of the ground, right? I mean, obviously there's a power component and we have to make, dig up materials and make computers, but, you know, how do you explain WordPress or Blippi? <laughs> you know, does anyone know Blippi, by the way? <laughs> Probably not, right? Blippi is, is social networking for your Visa card. <laughs> it's like automatically takes the, the purchases on your Visa card and then promotes them to a public uh, website and then people can social network around that. <laughs> um, so if you thought, um, you know, Twitter was crazy a few years ago, now we're doing Twitter for your Visa card. Um, but anyways, how do those have anything to do with uh, digging stuff out of the ground? And pretty much they don't have that much to do with it. Um, and so there, are, there have been a few um, economics pieces recently that really describe kind of how today's things work. And, and I, I wanted to point out a couple in case people want to read some of those books. And one of them was um, uh, The Wealth of Networks from Professor uh, Benkler at uh, Entrepreneurial Studies at Harvard Law. And he, he said this, he, he, he has this sentence in his book, and I, I had to read this. I mean, this really just smacks of um, the new economy. He said, the removal of physical constraints on effective information production has made human creativity and the economics of information itself the core structuring facts in the new networked information economy. So I thought I was bold in a lot of the stuff I say on my, on my blogs and all that, but that, that pretty much just shreds the old economy thinking, you know? And it, that is, you know, to me, that's where a lot of tech startups are. It's in, you know, the very origin of wealth now in a lot of startups companies is just figuring out a new means of collaboration. It's about, you know, social ties and, and regrouping, uh, regrouping peeps of pe uh, groups of people. Um, so with that in mind, um, think about that kind of in the background of your mind as I'm going through these slides and then think about what crowdfunding is. And crowdfunding is basically a, a form of social networking around, um, you know, funding companies um, around entrepreneurs. So that, to me, those two match, and uh, it has to be the future. Okay, so here are some reasons why, um, uh, you know, why crowdfunding, uh, how, sort of like, how did we get here um, in terms of startup companies? And then along the way, you know, I'll kind of point out why crowdfunding matches these things. And this will also be the kind of the case about why old school, uh, the old school of, of venture capital is, to me, in my opinion, dying off and it's not gonna last very long. Um, so the first is market time compression. And, it, you know, I like to express this like this. So the Stone Age was, was about two million years long. And the Bronze Age was about 2000. Um, the commercialized internet age is not even 20 years old yet. And the Twitter age is four years old. <laughs> um, so if you think about that graph, right? I mean, things are, 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 are getting faster and faster. It's sort of an inverse Moore's law of the generational time of technologies in our life. And, you know, that's, that's you know sort of a byproduct of the connectivity we have, right? We're able to reorganize, we're able to get information. Um, we have at least marginally two billion people in the world that are somewhat attached to the internet, going on seven billion. Um, and uh, you know the information flow is accelerating. The ability to disseminate information is um, just going astronomically uh, exponential. So that's going to keep going. Um, and. Um, it's not just the you know the market time of generations of technology that are, that are getting squeezed too. The uh, you know the time that you have to your investment opportunity windows are getting squeezed. So you know if something's only four years long, <laughs> you can't wait around for three to figure out whether you want to invest in something. You got to be on the money. Um, and so uh, whereas you know if you went back two centuries ago, you could probably wait 20 years or something to get into something new. Um, you'd be lucky to wait two weeks or two months now. And so, so how do you do that? Well, first you, you, know, you better have mechanisms that you can attach to a lot of people and figure out what's going on and tap into the collective IQ, which I'll talk about. 
Okay, so as, as things, uh, as, as the speed, the velocity is picking up in technology, and you know, I, I don't have to tell anyone things are changing quick, um, you know, at some point, you can only sort of squeeze the, the time down to so much, right? I mean, you know, you're not gonna have a technology that's gonna last one day. Um, but it's gonna, the, the momentum will keep going, and, and how's that keep going? And, and one direction that, as you know, you can't squeeze anymore, it'll vector off in another direction. And we're seeing this, this happening already, and that's that a lot of startup companies are focused on some kind of a multidisciplinary technology. So they're spanning, you know, two fields, three, four, five fields at once. And I'm sure you're seeing it in, in, the, medical, uh, in the medical fields too. In fact, I was out at, um, Penn State giving a speech there, and they were they had a project where they were combining people from nanotech making little nanobot bees to replenish to uh, do the job of the bees that are dying off from the the colony collapse disorder. Um, so they were kind of merging agriculture and, and nanotechnology in, in one bit. Um, but we're seeing this across the board. This has to happen. And in fact, if you if you really want to understand this multi multidisciplinary thing, there's a fantastic book called The uh, Medici Effect. And if you haven't read it, if you ever get a chance, read it. It's a fantastic read. And it really just talks about the fact that we have, if, you know, all the, not all of them, but a lot of great opportunities lie at the intersection of, of fields, you know, two, three, or four fields. And that makes sense, right, because those are the least exploited, you know, when you kind of combine a lot of stuff. Um, and, and that's what's happening now is, you know, whereas if you stay within a field, you can make incremental advances, and there's nothing wrong with that. But a lot of the awesome uh, opportunities out there come from the fact that you know you're you're merging a bunch of fields where you know people are boxed into one field and are not thinking about what happens when you intersect. Um, and you know this makes it harder and harder, obviously, for the venture guys to uh, to uh, to to make really good investment theses if you know your mind's in one camp or the other camp, right? So I'll talk a little bit about how we handle this with the crowd. Um, the, um, the good news, though, is that as we have all this connectivity and uh, we're kind of going exponential in a lot of different directions, um, and as people are merging fields, there's this surplus of ideas out there. I say idea, but it really it's surplus of problems, surplus of solutions. And this is really well um, elaborated in, um, in the book Crowd, Crowdsourcing by Jeff Howe um, in, the, in the following way. Um, he talks about, there was a study from a company called Innocentive, which is a crowdsourcing company which allows uh, most kind of different forms of science companies, biotech and stuff, to outsource solutions, or outsource acquiring solutions from people out there that might have expertise. So instead of relying on all of your own staff, let's put the, uh, the problem out there. Let's let people descend on it and solve it. And um, what they found was that not only does it work really well, but 70, you know, of, the, of all the solutions that were, uh, that were given to them using this mechanism, 75% were made from people who already knew the answer. So, you know, within a small team of people, because you're in this small set of disciplines and you have such a, a small collective IQ of people, your odds of solving, uh, solving problems in the new world where you need to span a lot of disciplines and have access to a lot of data, you know, your, your odds are, are a lot sort of less they were, than they were when we were solving more simplistic problems. So um, I, I really like that idea, like 75% of people, they already knew the answer. They didn't have to go, you know, think through the problem. It's like they'd already solved it on their own or in their own discipline. Um, and so um, there's another great uh, way to look at this surplus idea that I'm trying to get at, and that comes from a, a kind of a, a, an interesting story from the way from the past, and that was that um, I just ran across this a while ago, and I it was really jazzed by it, so I thought I'd put it in here. But um, for for like um, for centuries and centuries, people, um, especially on ships, encountered uh, the problem of getting scurvy, which is basically a vitamin C deficiency. It turns out to be. And, um, you know, for, I don't know, centuries they, you know, anybody that was at sea long enough to kind of run through their supply of vegetables and vegetables and fruits, they uh, would, would, would encounter this problem. And they had no idea why. They thought it was some, some bacteria, kind of virus or something. They looked for forever to figure out what the solution was. And it turns out that um, in, 
In 1753, a Scottish surgeon working for the British Royal Navy published a book on the solution for scurvy <laughs> called The Treatise of Scurvy. And he, so he figured that just by experimenting that if you give people oranges that they don't get scurvy when they're on a boat. <laughs> that was in 1753. We had troubles with scurvy all the way through until the, to the 20th century and the, until about World War I time frame. So a century and a half after he published a book on it, people were still having problems with scurvy because they didn't know. <laughs> um, you'd hope that wouldn't happen today. Um, of course, you can go back and look at a book. There's a, a book that's been uh, published in 1974, updated last year, called The World Without Cancer, where the guy, uh, G. Edward Griffin, makes the case that actually cancer is treatable as a uh, nutritional deficiency. <laughs> um, I'll leave that to you. You, know, you would be more qualified to vet that. but. Kind of rem it's sort of reminiscent of the uh, scurvy issue a uh, um, century before. So anyway, there's this, there's this huge pile of you know, solutions out there, ideas, problems. And you know, wh where do they come from? Um, in economics, uh, if you go back way back to Friedrich Hayek, he talked about it as local knowledge, but it's just a, a way of saying that you know, everyone has something that you know or maybe a group of people know that other people don't. Um, you know, something special or some data that you've been exposed to or experiences, whatever. Um, everyone has local knowledge. And so how do you tap, you know, two billion at least marginally connected people in the world going on seven? How do you tap all that? You know, how do we access all that, all those solutions, all those cool problems to solve? And that's, you know, one of the things that crowdfunding does, right, is we, we enable now a way to social, social network problems and solving problems and starting companies. And that's why, one of the reasons anyway, why I think that crowdfunding is gonna be huge, is it's just gonna, when, when we have the proper form of it, it's just gonna enable a massive, massive uh, set of, of new problems that were out there that we didn't know, the solutions for them, companies around them, new markets, um, where, you know, I think the, the world hasn't even begun to see the kind of economy that it could if we, if we opened up the tab. Um, all right, so now this local knowledge problem, I like to explain it this way, um, because I, I, it's kind of a fun analogy and it makes for a good picture. But if you were to take everything you knew, everything in your IQ, every experience you had, every part of the, uh, the wisdom you've got, and kind of run it through this IQ, this IQ prism here, and out come the constituent parts so that we could measure them, <laughs> kind of like a meat grinder for your IQ. Um, you would have a spectral graph, right? You'd have each of the components designated some part of your, of your own collective IQ. And here's what happens in startup companies. So we start with somebody whose profile looks like this, and then they hire people just like them, <laughs> just as smart, just as qualified, and a lot like them. And their plot looks something like that, and when you overlay the two, you end up with something that looks just like that. <laughs> um, and so this is a problem that people have is that they, they tend to flock together and so they, they're killing themselves because they're going the other direction of diversity. Now what if you had a problem that you needed to solve and you could actually identify the profile, the IQ profile, the collective wisdom profile of that a priori. And it didn't look like this, but it looked something like this, but there were some big components like right here, you needed a big spike somewhere to solve some problem, right? And you keep overlaying new, new, pe uh, new people on your team and they look kind of the same and you never get that spike, but then you, you, you hire in one very creative or sort of um, out of band person that fills in that spike because they're from some completely different field. And all of a sudden you can solve the solution. And that's exactly what's happening um, back here in this IQ surplus um, domain, at least when I talked about the Innocentive study where they found out that 75% of the people already knew the solution. <laughs> um, so that's why it, this, this problem, it doesn't go away in totality, but if you think about the fact that instead of looking at a team of 10 people in the startup or five or a company of 1,000 people, imagine what could happen when you can tap into 2 billion people. And that's, what I, that's where I'm really excited about crowdfunding. And so the diversity, you know, people give it a lot of lip service. We need diversity and there are programs in the government to make sure we have diversity and all this stuff. But my message here about diversity is, is that um, it's not a lip service thing, it's real in the sense that if you wanna solve problems in a time compressed world that require multidisciplinary thinking, you don't just 
want to have it as, as a nicety. It's a, it, it's a necessity. Like you must have people that are diverse. You have to force yourself to hire people unlike you. Otherwise, you're not going to compete. <laughs> you just won't have the collective IQ in your company to be able to compete with whatever other companies out there that is, that is um, you know, tapping into diversity. And you know, look at crowdfunding. You've, you're tapping into, you know, at some point, when if we had a Facebook of crowdfunding anyway, and we had 600 million people on it, we'd have one heck of a diversity out there, right? We'd have, uh, we'd have a, a spectral graph that was just you know, maxed out in a lot of components, right? So I, I, want, I want to talk about the, the issues that people raise about crowdfunding is, you know, I mean, as, as they should, um, there's sort of a lot of visceral reactions about crowdfunding, like uh, as soon as you tell somebody that it's going to go outside the domain of creating a, you know, new band album or something, you know, like, let's start the new Google on a crowdfunding platform. Um, and there are all kinds of issues pop up. So let's, let's run through those, and then you can follow up with some Q&A later, too, about um, your thoughts about some issues that come to mind. So the first is, um, you know, how do you, <laughs> if you've got a connected world of all these, you know, this is a, a diagram from a performance market study. I can explain that later if you want, but it's just a fun diagram about, you know, showing a lot of complexity of people connected. But how do you find, how do you find ideas on this? If you've got, you know, the Facebook of crowdfunding and 600 billion people or a billion people on it, how the heck do you manage all that? How do you work through and find good ideas, right? Um, and you know that's that's been on my mind for a while, and I've kind of worked through some solutions to to do that. And I'm going to talk about um, prediction markets uh, pretty quickly, and that's one of the answer. Um, but I think the the biggest thing about this is that from this graph, the reason I chose this graph in particular is that it kind of shows part of the answers, and that is like. You know, in the, in, um, in the way people are networked together, it's never just one, one hub and then spokes, right? It's always kind of clusters of people that are sort of interconnected in weird ways. And these, these bubbles here are really, you could think of them as affinity groups, where you've got a bunch of people who are kind of connected to this one person or this small set of people. Um, and they act as sort of a gateway between that cluster of people and the next cluster of people. That's how networks form. This is just this forms organically, you know, based on people's interests, their locality, you know, uh, time of day, all kinds of stuff. And so, these are super important in in tomorrow's crowdfunding because if you can identify these people and figure out, you know, how how they interact, and, and not only that, but what are their interests and how good are they, their performance metrics, and these sorts of things, then you can actually. If you think about how complex this is, if you were just to re reduce it down to these sort of uh, yellowish colored circles, then all of a sudden you have a lot simpler graph. And you know, in some ways, you, you can actually do that. And, uh, but these, these people are the, are the gatekeepers for this whole cluster of people, right? So if, you, um, if, you can, if they take inputs from these people and filter them down into something more manageable and pass them over to the next group, then you keep filtering and filtering and filtering then you can reduce the information down to something that's more manageable. And that, that will factor into the prediction market slide that I've got coming up, but it's super important to uh, focus on, on those uh, affinity groups that happen. So I always tell people that, um, you know, so one of my goals in crowdfunding is to make not only a crowdfunding platform, but to make a system where we can actually um, let people make predictions and use their predictions to uh, help people find the next good startup companies. And a lot of people um, that I've talked to are uh, dubious that um, we can actually let the crowd help us predict things, <laughs> especially in startups. Um, and I find that kind of interesting um, because we can, we, can, we can do predictions in every other field. <laughs> um, that's what prediction markets are, which is the next slide here. Um, and, and so, like, you know, we could predict box office receipts pretty accurately. Uh, we can use uh, these prediction market mechanics to predict the next presidential um, uh, electee very well. I mean, people are, drug discovery companies are using internally in their company to discover which drugs will go through the next phase, and their employees are accurately able to uh, determine that better than they could ever before. <laughs> 
We could use it for almost everything else. And yet, people can't you know, get behind the fact that we can use it for startup companies, which, which I like because if everyone thought it was great, they'd be doing it. Um, but the, the, you know, the reason I chose this chart, this came from a, um, a startup, um, got in the prediction market a little early, but it's called Predictify. And they, they use prediction markets and were able to show that on the top graph, if you were to just take um, the random crowd of people and, and ask them to predict who the Republican contender was going to be, um, you know, this is the result, the 34.6% under McCain. And, and if you were to apply prediction markets, which is simply that you took this crowd up here and you asked them the same questions, except for based on the history of things before they had predicted, you had divined how good they were at predicting and then weighted or kind of amplified their opinions more heavily than everybody else, then you would have this. And this is the difference in what happens when you go from a non-prediction market, just a general, you know, you call it a democratic vote, right, to uh, an amplified prediction market. And I contend that we'll be able to do the same exact thing for startup companies. And this is the information that, next, that tomorrow's venture capitalist wants to know. Um, so, the, what are the reasons that this can happen? Um, why can they predict box office receipts or who the president's going to be? Or why can we predict what the next uh, Facebook's going to be? And I, the reason is because that within the synthesis of everyone's uh, outputs or the, within the synthesis of their mind and the decisions they make is an enormous amount of inputs that they've received over time, right? They're, 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 and their experiences are baked in and all that. And so it's hard to even know what all those inputs are, but it doesn't matter because the only, the only part of the math that you need to understand is that there are all these people that have their own synthesis. They're taking inputs and creating one output. And as long as you're able to quickly identify who's good at, at particular fields, then you can amplify their opinion and off you go to a prediction market. Um, now, over time, they might get better and they may get worse, and so you need to monitor that. But you, as long as you can adaptively determine who's good, you have a prediction market. <laughs> so that's how those work. Um, and I'm very, um, very uh, bent on uh, introducing those into, uh, into crowdfunding. Um, so the second big ticket thing that people ask me is about um, and this is a really good one, a good question about it. like, well, if I have a really good idea, if I got the next, you know, Facebook, you know, do I want to tell everybody? And, you know, um, you know what, about, uh, what about privacy of my idea? And, you know, of course, then they learned that there was no such thing as an NDA in the venture capital world. But, but beside that, I mean, I don't blame people for not wanting to put it, um, the, the, the big idea online. So the way I explain this is not uh, the solution anyway to it is, what crowdfunding needs to do is take everything that we are doing in real life and replicate it online. Only make it more scalable because we can do it online. And so the way I envision this is that, you know, just like any way that, in any form of your life when you're doing trust or relationship building, you, you, you work this way. You, you know, if you start, start at the top and you work down, like in the idea world, you might, ha you might expose a very small slice of your idea, like your one line pitch or something. Uh, and that at the top to a wide audience of people. So um, you know, you, you go around, you give your elevator pitch to a thousand people or something, and then eventually you kind of cull it down based on the, the their interest level that you know they express and what if you heard they're any good or they're not going to go selling you out or whatever whatever your criteria is. But eventually you expose more and more of the idea to less and less people, and there's no reason why we can't do that on a social networking site. Right, so you can have, if you think about spheres of trust or walls or whatever, you know, you start in the outer, the outer sphere as a general public and you have to work your way in through gating mechanisms which we can put in crowdfunding and allow people to progress through this same progression but we can do it online. The nice thing is that in your, in the, in your physical life you have to do this manually. But on the online you could do it manually. You could have a button to say, okay, I allow this guy in because I know him into the next level, but you could do it programmatically. You could do it with scripts, right? You could do it based on performance. We talked about the prediction market. So I might say, uh, okay, I give somebody an idea, you know, and I'll tell you what, um, they can't progress to the next level until their uh, prediction market, you know, their, their prowess of predicting things is this good or their, their rate of return is X or their geography is Y or 
um, you know, they're, they've got 15 people that press the like button or something. I mean, you could do this, you can find new ways to, to gate this so that instead of being able to only talk to 100 people, you could talk to, or at least interact with 10,000 or 10 million because the machine's doing the work for you. But you could still do it manually if you want. Um, so that, that's my big answer for, uh, for this, you know, idea exposure. It's let's not do anything new. Let's just do what we do in real life and just replicate it online. Um, let's see. Okay. Another thing, this isn't something that people ask me, but it's something that I see um, we've got going on as a problem. And this isn't with crowdfunding, but uh, because uh, crowdfunding, I hope, kicks off a lot of startups and startups will encounter this problem, I want to I want to put it out there. And that is if you look at um, the duration that we've we've had for how long patents are granted for, the, the kind of exclusive monopoly you're given by the government. I mean, there's been a little jitter over time and they've been kind of monkeying with patent patent terms and stuff, but more or less it's been about 20 years since, you know, way back in, in, in England when the, uh, when the idea started. And, you know, today it's the same thing. Um, so that has been completely static, you know, and that hasn't at all recognized that, that that generational, that time compression that we're talking about going from, you know, you know, having a 50 year technology going down to, you know, Twitter age being four years. And so what we see is that that's the technology generation that kind of um, dashed the line that's coming down here. And something interesting happened in the 1990s, which was sort of the first half, which was uh, the beginning of the, what I call the commercialized internet age, where you know, people got browsers and dial up and started getting on the internet. At that inflection point, the general, generational age of stuff, of technology, um, not all, but a lot of technologies intersected with that duration of patents. And it's submerged under and it's gone down to where some technologies last for, you know, or at least social technologies last for two, three years and we're done. But the problem is that because of that, I mean, just think about this, right? You, you the, just the time that it could take before you, when you file and you're granted a patent, could be the time that the generation, that social technology actually lasts for. <laughs> you not even mention the fact, you know, that, Okay, it's useless then, and then your patent runs on for the rest of the 20 years. So this is actually going to really, um, really hinder uh, tech, uh, technology innovation and, and uh, in very lightweight, kind of easy to get started startup companies because, you know, you're going to have this sort of uh, way too long duration patent sit on top of uh, very uh, fast to market technology. So it's going to be you're going to be running up against patents all the time. And the way I'll, I like to explain this is this. Um, in, in economics, you've got you know, a, a distinction between the fact that you have money, which doesn't do anything on its own. You could bury this in your backyard and it wouldn't create economy. And, and if you have money moving through the system, then you have a, a velocity of money and that's where your economy comes from. Um, and so that's just a, a simple analogy that I want to work with because as soon as you kind of go from that concept of static and dynamic, whatever, then you realize that ideas work the same way. That there's a whole pile of ideas out there and they're in that kind of latent surplus that we talked about, right? But in, until you can do something with them and create companies and so forth, use them as a basis for the next company and, and all that, then you don't have innovation because innovation is really what happens when you get the velocity of those ideas working. But how can you have the velocity working when you have patents snuffing them out, right? So patents are going to be pretty key in the future, um, especially when they're 20 years in duration and ideas happen these days by the minute. Um, okay, so that was that my little bit on uh, patents, you know. Um, here's the other uh, thing I get a lot, you know, about crowdfunding, and that is like, oh my God, you know, people are going to be online trying to pile into the next Facebook, you know. And uh, what if it's not the Facebook and the and next Facebook and they all lose their money and stuff? So what happens? How do we prevent this groupthink from happening in, um, in crowdfunding? And I love this one, actually, because I think the right question to ask is how do you prevent bad groupthink? Because <laughs> good groupthink would be it is the next Facebook and you invested in it and you got in as, you know, uh, as a kind of a sole investor, you know, kind of a general crowd investor. I think that would be a good thing, right, if we can figure out how to get people in the next Facebook, um, you know. So we don't want to eliminate groupthink, we want to eliminate bad groupthink. Um, and here's an observation I've made after studying a lot about groupthink, believe it or not, trying to figure out how to solve all these problems. And that is that um, there, are, there are a few kinds of groupthink. Um, and if you walk by a restaurant and, it, and it's not empty, it's full in there, 
restaurant's busy, you're like, hey, I'm going to go eat at this restaurant because there's people in there. Congratulations, you just, you know, you just um, operated within the confines of groupthink. But um, so the thing about groupthink is that all forms of it, um, be it good or bad, are subject to fragility, which means that they're extremely easy to bust. Only, it only takes one piece of adverse information propagated to people that's contrary to some underpinning of that groupthink, and it dissolves quickly. And the reason is, this is really easy to, to, to comprehend in a real in a simple uh, thought experiment, which is, imagine you've got a million people doing the same thing, and they're all different kind of people with different minds. The only way that they could be doing groupthink is if the rule set was extremely simple, <laughs> right? The only way to get a diverse set of a million people doing the same thing. So that means that all you need to do is, is, is show them something that busts one of those rules they're operating on, and away goes the groupthink. So, Okay, so how do we get rid of this group thing? Understanding that it's, you know, you just need to attack something that's, um, you know, some basic uh, one wrong op thing that they're operating on. Uh, the first thing you can do to get rid of group think is, is, um, this is the idea of showing them uh, some uh, facet by, by way of these prediction markets, for example, would be one that would say, hey, look, uh, you know, you're all dogpiling into this next Facebook startup company, but the people who are really good are saying, this is not the thing to invest in. You know, that might make you back off, right? Like, there's this set of people who keep being right all the time, and they're not in this. In fact, they're saying this is a stinker, you know? That I might not want to jump in this. So you can actually use... Pr you can actually just use being right or, or finding people who are right and, and showing their opinion to the people who might invest um, what those are. So you can actually use performance markets as a way to bust groupthink, at least bad forms of groupthink. Um, and the other way is that, um, now what we don't want to do really ever is prevent people from investing in something they want to invest in because in, in a crowd, it's a little bit different than venture capital in the sense that a crowd, some people are investing because the relative is starting a company, you know, and their friends, you don't want to stop them from investing in that if they want to, right? So, but what we want to do, we want to deliver information as best we can so that people can make decisions about what, uh, what it is they're investing in. And the best way I've found so far in, in all my studies is that, um, you know, show people uh, the best kind of prediction metrics that you can about uh, the particular startup company. And um, if you can get that, you don't really even need to get that out to everybody. If you remember that chart we had with the affinity groups, actually, if if the people who are driving those, those little mini hubs, if those people understand those metrics, then pretty much everybody who's connected to them tends to run with them. So you only need to get that information out to uh, those hubs, basically. All right, so that's, um, that's my spiel on groupthink, um, topic that I really like a lot, by the way. Um, now, giving all that about what I mentioned about, you know, how things are compressing and how we're going multidisciplinary, um, the, the, you know, how we're getting tapped to, how we're connecting exponentially more people and, and so forth. Um, what I like to do is go back and think, you know, okay, that's sort of where, that's the path along which crowdfunding can execute very well on because it can tap into all those trends. But, you know, looking back, how's the, uh, how's the traditional venture capital industry been doing? You know, how's it managing uh, compression and the velocity of all these ideas and all this? Um, so one good way to, to have a look at this is to look at their 10-year uh, benchmark internal rate of return. <laughs> Not too good. Um, and... <clears throat> I've heard all kinds of stuff from people like, well, the IPO window got closed down and, you know, uh, the economy bad, the economy's bad, um, must be all these things. Honestly, you could remove all those things from the equation and we'd still have the same problem. Uh, the, might, the number might change a little bit. But um, two things I've got to say. One is that uh, this had to happen. It could have been, this could have easily been predicted a long time ago. And it's because we have all these things. We have market compression. We have multidisciplinary uh, trend going on. We have more and more people tapped in. This, if you think about how big can a venture capitalist, how big can their network be? How big are they tapped into? It's becoming a smaller and smaller network that they can be tapped into you know, directly or fairly directly compared to the size of the crowd, that, the, the, the kind of network that's out there. So that means that they have a narrower version of the collective IQ every year. So unless they figure out how to tap into the crowd, 
as far as I'm concerned, it's going to keep going downhill. And that was easily uh, predictable quite some time ago. And so what would be the response to this, by the way, if, if you are not able to handle the, you know, all these early stage ideas and stuff, well, you'd probably move up, you know, up market to bigger, uh, bigger kind of later stage deals, de-risked. Um, that's exactly what's going on in venture capital. Um, and then they open the door for the super angels, which are basically small venture capitalists to come in, generally from people who are deep in the field before. Um, so all that said, the, there's sort of an interesting phenomenon uh, going on, which I see the crowd enabling, and that is, it's, if you think about what peer-to-peer -peer is, if you take peer-to-peer -to, -peer to venture capital and you realize that we're all actually venture capitalists now, we're all entrepreneurs, we're all service providers, we are, we are actually all part of a collective now because tomorrow's crowdfunding will actually use your expertise to figure out which deals are good, even if you're not doing a startup company. Right? You'll, be, you'll be either actively or passively involved in, a, in, a, in making predictions. I mean, it might, predictions might just be from you know, your actions or what do you look at or whatever, but you'll be part of the venture capital feedback loop. So you might, you might be investing, you'll probably do a little investing while you're at it too. Right? You might be an entrepreneur, but we're actually all venture capitalists and we're all entrepreneurs. And we're all part of this collective IQ that gets factored into, um, into decisions that are being made. I think it's kind of exciting, actually. I like, I like the thought that, you know, kind of, that instead of boundaries of this, this cycle of venture capital industry and entrepreneur industry and service providers, that, you know, we're actually part of a collective. In fact, if you look at what's happening in companies now, it sort of models this in that um, rather than have like, you know, here's, your office and here's your title on the door, your title X, it's more like, okay, we need so, something done. So we assemble a, a team of uh, diverse people to solve a problem. And then when that's done, we you know, kind of uh, get rid of that and then reconstitute a new team from a different set of people, right? So that's basically taking the collective you know, IQ inside your company and then sort of pulling a subset of those people and applying them to a project. I think that's actually where things are going. I think the idea of titles is sort of going away um, the idea of like specific, like this is what I'm good at and that's it, that's kind of going away. Um, but the cool thing is that um, now you're a venture capitalist. <laughs> um, and, and the other thing that I thought was kind of funny was that when going back to that diversity slide that I talked about, um, you know, if you just think like if you were, if you were a, a traditional venture capitalist today and you looked at a team that was pitching you something and there's three people, right? You might want to like know how diversified they are. So you know, it would be kind of cool if tomorrow's Facebook or LinkedIn spit out a, a, a diverse atometer meeting, you know, a, a reading or something where you know it's like I'm very diversified, <laughs> or these are the things that I, the components of the IQ that I have. Um, we don't have anything like that today, but it'd be kind of cool if we did. <laughs> um, so um, while everybody's a VC, I'm also an author, <laughs> and this is the book. Um, that I'm, I guess, in a way, I'm hawking here, but um, I'll give you a free ebook if you want. Um, and that goes through a lot of this and, I'll, and, and a lot more, of course. And um, just to be, uh, to be complete, I gotta have my graphic attributions. I ripped off most of these graphics from Google Images. Um, and then I thought I would just open it up for Q&A, because I, I like uh, Q&A more than anything, to be honest with you. <laughs>